Thanks, and thanks for coming to the talk. So uh, like you said, I'll be talking today about how deep unordered composition can rival syntactic methods for text classification. So I'm Mohit, and this is joint work with uh, Varun Manjunatha and Hal Daumey from the University of Maryland and Jordan Boyd-Graber from the University of Colorado. So before we can understand exactly what I mean by deep unordered composition, uh, I just wanted to go over a brief background of the vector space model framework for NLP. So in a vector space model, we represent words with uh, low dimensional vectors called embeddings. And these are typically on the order of uh, 50 to 1,000 dimensions. Uh, so you can see here that on the left, we have a number cluster of words. So things like two, three, four, five, several, many. And to the right, we have an occupation cluster. So chairman, director, trader, president. Um, so in this work, we're not really concerned with how we learn individual word embeddings, but rather how we go from one word to many words. Um, and this process is called composition. Uh, so we have an example here. If we have the sentence, I love their music, um, we're interested in learning this function G, this composition function that takes in as input the four embeddings associated with the sentence and outputs a single vector that represents the meaning of that sentence. And so what exactly do we mean by meaning? Um, here we look at meaning as being task specific. So uh, a phrase might mean one thing or its uh, representation might, might say one thing for sentiment analysis and a totally different thing for parsing. Um, and in this work, we're focused mainly on uh, the first two tasks here, sentiment analysis and factoid question answering. And so our main contribution is a fast and simple composition function that rivals more complex methods on both of these tasks. Uh, so here's an outline for the rest of the talk. Uh, first, we'll review some existing composition functions. Um, then we'll go over our proposed uh, model, the Deep Averaging Network, or the DAN. Um, then we'll go through some experiments on both factoid QA and sentiment analysis. And finally, we'll look at how exactly do uh, deep averaging networks work and um, go through some fine-grained comparison um, to previous work. Okay, so uh, there are two main types of composition functions. Uh, the first one, the simplest one, is unordered, or a bag of words style composition function. And so in this case, uh, if we have the sentence, I love their music, and we shuffle around the order of the words in the sentence, we will get the same vector. Um, and obviously this isn't desirable. Uh, so the alternative is a syntactic composition function. And syntactic composition functions incorporate word order and syntax into this uh, G function here. Um, so for example, uh, I love their music will give a different vector than love music I there. Uh, furthermore, we can inject information such as the fact that their music forms a noun phrase um, into this G function to influence the final representation of that sentence. Okay, so we'll start with unordered composition. Uh, the simplest neural unordered composition function is the ENBO, or neural bag of words model. And so in this model, um, we basically just apply a simple element-wise vector operation to all of the input word embeddings. So this could be something like a sum, multiplication, or here we look at the average. Um, so the advantages of this model are it's very fast and simple to both understand and implement. Um, and we'll go to a more concrete example here in Enbo for sentiment analysis. So say we have this sentence, predator is a masterpiece, and we want to be able to predict positive sentiment from this sentence. Uh, what we do is we average together these four embeddings that represent the sentence, and then pass it through a uh, softmax layer to predict a positive label. So this is a very simple model, easy to implement. Uh, but it has a drawback that it's just not very good. Um, it performs poorly on downstream classification tasks. So the alternative, uh, syntactic composition functions. And here we're concerned primarily with the neural network-based approaches. Um, usually they do much better than unordered functions, the ENBO model on downstream tasks. Um, we're focused here in particular on the recursive neural network, although the recurrent and convolutional network architectures are similar in principle. Okay, so uh, how exactly does a recursive neural network work? Um, we give it not only the four input embeddings for the sentence that we saw before, but also the parse tree of this sentence. 
And so instead of just averaging together these four embeddings and passing it through a classification layer, we actually start with this low level phrase here, a masterpiece, and compute a representation for this phrase by applying an affine transformation to the children and then applying a nonlinearity f, which could be something like tan h or uh, relu. So once we have a representation for the phrase a masterpiece, uh, we can then recursively combine this with the embedding for is to get a representation for the phrase is a masterpiece. And note that here we share this weight uh, W across all nodes in the tree. Um, so finally, when we get a representation here Z sub 3 for the root level node, uh, we can put our softmax layer uh, over that <coughs> node as before and have it predict a positive label. So in practice, we should note that uh, we actually need a softmax layer over all of the nodes in this tree to avoid uh, problems with the vanishing gradient, which we won't get into here. You can read more about it in the paper. Okay, so uh, why do these recursive neural networks perform better than neural bag of words models? It, how much of this improvement is directly attributable to the syntactic information that a recursive neural network has and that the ENVO model doesn't have? So we, we note that uh, recursive neural networks actually have two distinct advantages over ENVO models. Uh, one is syntax, obviously. Uh, ENVO models don't have access to the parse tree information. But second is that in a recursive neural network, you pass the input embeddings through a series of nonlinear transformations. Um, and Richard Soker and colleagues report that when you remove the nonlinearity, that F, from the recursive neural network, uh, you dramatically lower your accuracy on sentiment classification tasks. Um, so the neural bag of words model that I showed earlier is a linear mapping between uh, the average embedding and the output label. So what happens if we add nonlinearities? Can we make a better comparison to recursive neural networks? And can we isolate how much exactly does syntax help um, in this task? So, our uh, proposed model is very, very simple, the deep averaging network. Um, we start with the uh, ENBO framework, the averaged embedding here, but instead of directly passing this through a, uh, to a classification layer, we first feed it through uh, two or uh, as many as you want nonlinear transformations, and then finally apply the softmax layer. So it's a very trivial modification to the ENBO model, but we hope that it will um, allow us to isolate uh, the effect of syntax. Okay, so we'll move on now to experiments. Uh, we look at both factoid question answering and sentiment analysis, and we'll start with factoid QA. So we look at this task in the context of Quiz Bowl, which is a, a trivia game played between two teams. And so it's similar to Jeopardy in that a moderator will read a question to these teams and they have to give an answer. Uh, but it's different in that uh, contestants can interrupt the moderator at any point while he's reading the question with a guess. And so uh, in Quiz Bowl, you have to decide not only what answer to give, but also when you're confident enough in that answer to make the guess. Uh, so I have a little example question here for the audience to play around with. Uh, so I'll read a question out, and if at any point uh, anyone here knows the answer, raise your hand. And if you're correct, uh, you'll get bragging rights. Okay. This creature has female counterparts named Penny and Gown. This creature appears dressed in Viking armor and carrying an axe when he is used as the mascot of Pax, a least privileged protection patch. Okay. This creature's counterparts include Demon on the Berkeley Software Distribution, or BSD. For 10 points, name this mascot of the Linux operating system, a penguin whose name refers to formal male attire. Yeah, good job. <laughs> so you can see through this example that uh, your goal should be to answer the question after hearing as little text as possible. So we are interested in particular here at um, the sentence positions one and two which we define as early in the question. So if we get the answer correct over here, we have a high chance of getting it before anyone else. Okay, so the data set we use, uh, we use the history quiz bowl question data set of uh, our EMNLP work last year, which can, it's pretty small. It consists of uh, about 4,000 question answer pairs and 450 or so unique answers. 
Um, we also augment this data set with around 50,000 uh, sentence page title pairs from Wikipedia. So we have two different data sets here. Um, and the models we consider, the, the first is a standard non-neural unordered baseline, uh, just your standard bag of words uh, logistic regression. We also add in some dependency relation features. Uh, we also use an information retrieval system with uh, standard term weighting, query expansion, fuzzy query matching. Um, then uh, of more interest is Quanta, which is a syntactic recursive neural network uh, structured around dependency parse trees. And finally, our deep averaging network, which has three hidden layers, and it's trained with uh, word dropout regularization, which for more details, you can see our paper. Okay, so uh, these are results on the original 4,000 uh, question answer pair data set. So of interest here are the relative performances of Quanta and Dan. So we see that the Dan is consistently about 1% to 2% behind the syntactic Quanta, but takes way less time to train. Um, and so when we add Wikipedia, though, we notice a more interesting result uh, that uh, the Dan is able to leverage the additional 50,000 Wikipedia sentence page title pairs to improve performance by 8% almost on the uh, first sentence position, whereas Quanta actually uh, decreases in accuracy when you give it the uh, additional data from Wikipedia. So why is this happening? Uh, we're not exactly sure, but we theorize that the Dan's syntactic ignorance is actually helping it on uh, this uh, um, augmented Wikipedia data set. So the reason for this is that sentences from Wikipedia are syntactically different from quiz bowl sentences. And so um, in particular, in quiz bowl, you have this very common imperative construction. Identify this author who wrote blah, uh, name this battle in this war, for example, which you would never see in Wikipedia. Wikipedia never demands anything of its readers. Um, the second point here, the, that Wikipedia sentences contain lots of noise, applies to both Dan's and uh, syntactic models equally. Uh, for example, this sentence is from Emily Bronte's Wikipedia page. She does not seem to have made any friends outside her family. Uh, this sentence could apply to a number of people, not just Emily Bronte, and thus is totally useless when we're doing uh, uh, quiz bowl answer uh, classification. So uh, our theory is that because the Dan only has to deal with the noise in the Wikipedia data set and not the syntactic diversity, it's better equipped to improve with the additional data, whereas Quanta gets stuck up at the um, syntactic differences from between Quiz Bowl and Wikipedia. Okay, so uh, since the publication of this uh, paper, we have since scaled up a Dan um, with some language models to handle uh, a much bigger data set of 100,000 or so question answer pairs and 14,000 unique answers. And so we actually had a match against a team of four uh, former multiple day Jeopardy champions versus our system. And the result was inconclusive. We actually tied them uh, 200 to 200. Uh, we were winning the entire match and then the humans made a run towards the end. Um, so round two in October, our system will uh, go against Ken Jennings to truly determine who is better at Quiz Bowl, man or machine. And so here's a picture of uh, the four Jeopardy champions after uh, the first question of our match, which our system got correct very early. You can see that they're not uh, exactly pleased. Um, okay, so now we'll move on to sentiment. Um, we look at both sentence and document level sentiment uh, analysis tasks. So on the sentence level, uh, Rotten Tomatoes and the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank, both of which include uh, binary positive negative classification tasks. The SST also includes a fine grain classification task, which is zero being most negative and five being most positive. Uh, at the document level, we look at the IMDB review data set, which is uh, another binary classification task. Okay, so here we're concerned with uh, comparing the Dan against syntactic composition functions. And so on these data sets, uh, uh, there have been numbers reported by standard recursive neural networks and more powerful variants. Um, same with convolutional networks and their variants and other neural syntactic models. So the results, we'll first start with just comparing the Dan to the simple ENBO model. So how much did the nonlinearities actually help? 
And you can see that on all four of the tasks, uh, we outperform the ENVO. And these results are particularly large. The differences, I mean, are large on the Stanford sentiment tree bank um, and the fine grain classification task. So when we add in the syntactic uh, composition comparisons to this table, uh, we see that while the DAN isn't state of the art on any of these tasks, um, it's competitive and in some cases uh, gets higher accuracies than uh, many of these um, syntactic models. And so this is interesting and sort of concerning because the DAN has no idea about uh, word order or syntax, and yet, um, and it has no way to model negation, but it still does within a few percentage points of these other more complicated models. So uh, how do DANs work? Um, what are the nonlinearities doing? Uh, so we, we, our intuition suggests that the nonlinear layers of the DAN are sort of magnifying small but meaningful uh, differences in the vector average. Uh, and so what do I mean by this? Uh, we do a perturbation analysis to uh, see if our intuition is correct. So we have this original sentence, the film's performances were awesome, and we construct four modified versions of the sentence by replacing the last word with uh, four words of varying sentiment polarity. So for example, the film's performances were cool, okay, the worst, and underwhelming. Uh, these sentences range from positive to neutral to negative. And we compare at each layer of a five-layer DAN the difference between the modified sentence and the original sentence's vector representation at that layer. So you can see that at layer zero, which is the corresponding to the ENBO model, all of these sentences are about equally different from the original sentence. But as we get deeper and deeper into the network, by the fifth layer, uh, you see that the film, the performances were cool, is fairly similar to the original sentences, while these two, the negative sentences, are very different by the end of this uh, network. So finally, what about negations? Negations are sort of the calling card of syntactic composition functions. In theory, they should be able to handle negations. Uh, so we collect around 100 sentences from the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank that each contain uh, one negation and one contrastive conjunction. So these are sentences like uh, that have not and but in them, basically. And we interestingly, we find that on all of these sentences, uh, whenever uh, both the unordered Dan on our syntactic point of comparison, a deep recursive network, uh, sees a negation, um, they're predisposed to predict negative sentiment um, around 70% of the time. And so uh, it's very interesting that both the unordered and syntactic model have this exact same behavior when confronted with a negation. And it brings to question whether um, on these data sets the syntactic models are actually generalizing to things like negation. And so we have some examples here. Uh, which you can read, but I direct your attention to the last row of this uh, table. This is a synthetic sentence that we made up. The movie was not bad. Um, and so both the DAN and the recursive neural network think that this is of negative sentiment. And I guess you can argue whether it's uh, positive or neutral at worst, but it's certainly not a negative sentence. And the fact that um, neither model can handle this such a simple construction is sort of worrying. Okay, so to recap, uh, we introduced the DAN for fast and simple text classification, and our findings suggest that nonlinearly transforming the input is crucial for performance, um, perhaps even more so than actually modeling syntax uh, for these two tasks. Um, furthermore, we found that uh, the more complex syntactic functions uh, make mistakes similar to those of the unordered dance, uh, as we showed with the negation uh, experiment. So in conclusion, syntax is obviously important, but for these tasks, we need more data and um, or models that can generalize to things like negation with fewer examples. So thanks, and the code is available at uh, this link here, and it should be um, updated with more stuff in the next few days. <laughs>